7 a.m., June 27th, Wednesday morning. We'll call this meeting of the Fergus Falls City Council Committee to hold to order. Roll call, please. Yep. Here. Here. Rupert's coming. He's walking the door. Here. Here. Yes. We have a quorum. First item of business this morning is a discussion item on public improvement 9502, and I'll call on our city engineer, Brian Uvaro. Thank you, and good morning, Your Honor and members. Uh, the car before you is in regards to the old wastewater treatment plant. Uh, if you recall a few months ago, this council authorized me to procure a hazardous materials survey proposal from Bond Intertech. Uh, that proposal was accepted. They have conducted the work. Uh, they have, based on the report uh, at the plant site, there is a certain amount of uh, asbestos containing material that is typical for this type of work uh, present on some stru structures within the site. So since then, I've also contacted Landwehr Construction, also provided me a budgetary estimate to demolish this site as shown up there on the projector. Uh, interstate Engineering, I also procured a professional service agreement from Interstate Engineering as well to do the um, design, a proposal for design and the specifications. Based on all these costs and everything, if the council chooses to proceed with, I'm estimating the demolition of the old wastewater treatment plant at approximately $650,000. Uh, this price too is, being that we don't have any redevelopment intentions with this site yet, it'd be consistent with uh, restoring, redeveloping as a recreational site. Uh, being that, 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 uh, that significantly what the PCA requires us to do when it comes to demolition, that impacts obviously the costs. But th this price right here, if this council would like to proceed, that's what I'm estimating these costs thus far at. So um, requesting, if approved, to uh, accept Interstate Engineering's professional services proposal for design in the amount of $20,000 and order the project plans and specifications. Scott. Is the funding going to come out of the uh, sewer funds that were come from? More than likely, I've yeah. spoken with Bill Sommore and everything, but as we develop and get more refined costs, we'd also be proposing if we're going to bond for it or be coming out, but it would be a sewer enterprise fund eligible item. Yes, go ahead, Rod. So specifically, if we had, um, let's say we wanted to put uh, some kind of facility there, you know, like a uh, camping trailer facility or some other are you saying under the current construction agreement or, or deconstruction that we wouldn't have that ability to do that? We would have to check into, I guess, to clarify uh, for redevelopment, yes, recreation probably as far as parks and potentially camp, we can refine that. I'm more so referring to if it was redeveloped as for buildings or commercial development, things like that, but that's something we can check into. To clarify, would, but I, that's the yeah. Intense. I would like to know, you know, if we're going to do the, the deconstruction, yes, I would like to know um, what the potential reuses can be, mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like that's one thing we don't know. Is that true? That is very true, and I believe that's why the treatment plant is in its current state. Yeah, uh, there has not been any redevelopment potential. Uh, well, there's always potential, but there's been no redevelopment options moving forward with the site. So it's, uh, it's totally, you know, within a region, you know, with the council, how they want to proceed with this project. Um, the, the, the other probably thing, if you're going to look into like, I mean, one of my questions was, you know, what was the land suitable for post cleanup, but also would be the railway crossing. Um, is that Obviously, there's different definitions of rail, rail crossings, and, and if you start to move volumes of traffic over there, that might change mm -hmm. how, how the railroad view it. That could be. It's a localized site. I can't imagine too many, but that's something we could take a look at. Yeah. <coughs> Go ahead, Darren. Um, how big is the piece of property? Ooh, I don't remember. I believe it's plus five. Uh, like six. I don't have that off the top of my head. Uh, that was in the original report. I'd have to look that up again. And we really don't have <coughs> a thought out use for it at the present time, right? So, no. Thanks. Brian, what would it take to 
get some of the you know potential uses or what would be acceptable? I mean, is that gonna is that gonna add a lot to the work going into this? Um, no, I would definitely like you know like I said that would help steer us in this in what direction and that's that's good conversation to have uh, with the site. You know, we do have safety concerns with the site as well, but. Sure. Uh, uh, like I said, that uh, redevelopment, I can perhaps um, do more review in regards for redevelopment if it would be like a commercial and everything. But like I said, that's um, for all practical purposes, this is just for demolition, for recreational repurposing, restoration. Amy, did you have a uh, The site was included in the downtown riverfront master plan. There wasn't any specific concepts looked at, but there was some feedback provided that could be a starting point for uh, future opportunities. So is that something we want to bring back before we initiate this project? So are you thinking a um, month, two weeks, or what, what, how much time would you need? You wouldn't want to do this on Monday night, I'm assuming, right? I prefer not. <laughs> <laughs> but, just do you want to bring it back to this committee when Absolutely, you have some that um, would definitely help. So. Your, your Honor, I got a question. You know, because of the safety, I don't know if anybody's ever been down there, but it's not a very good place. There's the tanks are full of water. Um, a lot of things floating in that water that I don't know what it is, but I think we should move ahead with the plan. But then come back and bring this. You know, talk about what we do afterwards. But we need to move, get move ahead. I mean, it's it's a mess down there. It needs to be taken care <coughs> of. Now it's on the table again. I think we should move ahead with the twenty. You want you're asking for the twenty thousand dollars for the. Yes, and I and and that's a very good point. Not to interrupt. And you're right. It is very. There's a lot of uh, unsafe thing, uh, safety issues around there. Uh, I could talk to Interstate Engineering too, and perhaps amend their professional prefer proposal to include. Uh, different scenarios for redevelopment. Uh, I don't know what those, those thresholds are off the top of my head, but we can review that too as well. And another question is, if we keep moving on this to get the demo, would that be done this year? Yeah, it, it, more than likely, yes. We have all the reports. It could be, by it sounds to me that uh, figuring out the redevelopment scenarios, whatever they may be, um, not that we would develop it into any of those at this time. We could make a green. We could just make a green, and and then yes. we could move on. I mean, I'd be that would be the intention. That was what I, I think that would be best. Our best interest if you uh, if we go down and look at it. And I was down there. Just, um, it really, nice. regardless of what the long term development, right. we do need to get it. To, to clarify, yeah, there's a few other things, but in general, like recreationals, you know, they. Um, will deconstruct and leave portions of the abandoned structures in place, generally about four feet below grade, you know, things of that nature that, you know, would take in consideration. But uh, we can look, like I said, we could like talk to Interstate and we could uh, amend the proposal to include other uh, redevelopment if the council so chooses, even though we would restore it as a turf area in the meantime. Uh, but that, that, those liabilities on that site would be removed. Right. That's that's where I'm looking. If you guys just go down and look at it. It's, it's you'd be. So I'll make a motion to move ahead with that. Second. 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 And then, Darren, you have a comment. Um, and then we're, if we're trying to do that this year, we're probably a little bit behind on this question. But I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Is there any state grant money available for deconstruction of these particular treatment plants? Uh, other than PFA. Uh, I would have to look, review that too as well. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> I'd like to offer amendment to the motion. Go ahead with your amendment. And that would be that we uh, specify to interstate to do that initial uh, look at what the repurposing would be. Um, we can move ahead with this, but that interstate is involved in knowing where we're going, we could go with this thing. Is that what I understood? You could check with interstate? Yes, that's yeah. going to dictate what, how the contractor would remove, in what fashion or type, or to what, what extent the contractor would remove, right. abate the site. And the only reason I'm asking is, I mean, based on the principle, you know, voting on principle, if we begin with the end in mind, we know what we could have, then we don't just have another site. We have plenty of empty city lots that we have to take care of and stuff, and we need to be able to see if we can use them in the future. So I think this will give us a clear idea of if we can use it as long as we can offer that amendment. So, so we have an amendment. Is there a second to that amendment? amendment? Yeah, second. Second to the amendment. I just got one more thing. You know, being since it's below water to powers, the Pisca Dam 
It's going to be. I mean, that's they're going to put conditions on us because it's you can't build nothing below the dams anymore. I don't. I don't believe. Well, that that that's, is something we definitely take yeah, in consideration. So, okay. It would be identified if we had a yeah development plan for that. But Otter Tail Power does have a building in that located within right. that site too as well. Yeah. So it does have. All right. So Scott, you're okay with that amendment? Yep. Brent, are you okay yep. with that amendment? Okay. All in favor of that amended motion, say aye. 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 Sign that motion carries. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, unless you're not in a great big hurry, Andrew is. We're going to move <laughs> Andrew up. <laughs> just, just two items. We've got to get down to St. Paul today. So I'm going to call on Andrew Bremseth for an update on the National Registry eligibility of the Regional Treatment Center. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the Council, good morning. Uh, there will be a couple of us exiting at 730. So if you're speaking, don't be offended. <laughs> we're, we're heading down to St. Paul for the day. So um, just wanted to give the Council an update this morning on the National Registry eligibility determination at the Regional Treatment Center. As you all know, in light of the uh, development interest on east and west detached, we had to determine if our phase two demolition or deconstruction actions would impact the overall campus designation, thus eliminating the ability to utilize historic tax credits. And um, I guess I'm happy this morning to report to the council and to the public that in working with the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service, we were able to get the determination that um, we could proceed with phase two activities and not impact the campus registry status. So um, we'll be able to do phase two if we get through all the, the uh, different phases of the SHPO review. And um, we've secured the money through the bonding bill and um, we'll still be able to have the development group access those historic tax credits that are associated with the site. So it's, it's really good news um, for us. Our plan continues to come together and um, I've been impressed with how the, the boxes have been checked, so to speak. And um, the, the process was really kind of painless. We were always, you know, wondering how long it would take to get through those different levels of bureaucracy. And uh, they actually expedited the process, and, and that's greatly appreciated. So i um, glad to share this morning that it was determined that the uh, registry status will still be intact after the uh, actions of the phase two deconstruction project. That's great good news. Yeah. A, couple, a couple of questions on the RTC. Um, I'm just kind of curious, obviously um, at the last council meeting, Gene Schmidt um, brought up about doing a credit, or, you know, had we looked into the buyer, you know, this potential buyer of parts of the, um, and um, obviously, you know, they were asking whether we'd done any due diligence on that, and that person, and obviously we, we, should, we, we should be obligated at least to respond you know, whether we have or not. And I was also curious, which council member is on the negotiating team now in, in, that's interfacing with the buyer? Your Honor, members, I can answer that. The, the mayor has been involved with uh, the negotiating piece. We haven't set up a formal negotiating team as far as I'm concerned, but the mayor has been uh, part of those discussions. And Amy will elaborate on your first question, but I will note that uh, after the council meeting, Mr. Schmidt, caught me and we had a good dialogue. So I did, I did respond to that question. We certainly haven't done so publicly, but Amy will do that right now. <laughs> sure. Well, I don't know all the details of what you and Mr. Schmidt spoke about, but uh, as far as our interactions with the current uh, East and West uh, detached developer, uh, we are continuing to look, um, we are looking at some additional projects just based on that question, but we had prior to that uh, discussion at the council meeting, analyzed some previous experience as far as um, projects they had successfully completed and uh, looked at those um, within the, the realm of that. As far as the review of financials, Kent Madsen has continued to be involved at, from the legal perspective in this project and has done uh, similar work um, as applicable to this project uh, with other, as he has with other projects. So um, we're you know, we will look at some further projects just to, um, there was one in particular that was asked about that we'll dig into a little further and see, you know, what um, the nature of that project was uh, that was raised. And so we will continue to do that. But at this point, everything looks very strong and solid in relation to those two, um, the two areas that they're looking at. Would it, would it be possible then to, like, share that? You know, and then that might help, obviously, the public feel that this is a competent group. Yep. Uh, Mayor, I mean, the, one, the ones that, not the financial details, but at least the projects that they've been involved in and, you know, yep. that have been successful. Yep. Uh, 
I was going to suggest, um, Mayor, Councilmember Hicks, that we could do a summary statement from uh, Mr. Matson on the financial, not provide details like you expressed, and then an overview of the projects that have been looked into as far as similar um, types of endeavors with the various financing structures and um, tax credits, et cetera. And, be and happy then, to do that in a memo form yeah, and provide and to the council. Probably in addition to that, could we add then what they're actually proposing so that that's clear? Because I think that was oh. another thing that Jean was kind of, and, and the planning committee had concerns about. Sure. Uh, so, yeah. So, Mayor, Councilmember Hicks, to be clear, the, um, the types of units? Yep. Yep, okay. Mm. Thank you. <coughs> Next item will go to item number four of Prairie Public Television Request. And again, I'll call on City Minister Randy Brumsack. Thank you, Your Honor. Members, um, Prairie Public Television, and more specifically the show The Almanac, has requested access to the Regional Treatment Center to film the interior of it. Um, just reading from emails with uh, Mary <coughs> Lahammer, the reporter that uh, works on that TV show, she indicated that they're working on a documentary based on a series of reports touring former state facilities. Um, they indicated they don't have to be in for long, but they want to explain why the building needs to be demolished and um, further indicated that it's a statewide television show with the longest running, highest rated public affairs show in television history. And she's confident that legislators watch their show religiously. So um, they're willing to sign waivers. They've done many of these dilapidated tours in the past. Um, I don't feel strongly one way or the other about it. Just told her that I would bring it forward and see if the council wanted to entertain that. And I also informed her that um, not to be overly optimistic. So I don't think she would be surprised if the council were to turn her down. But um, that's the request before you, and um, we'll let her know one way or the other how the council wants to proceed. It, it, I think one of the considerations always is you know, how many of these requests we're getting and how much staff time does it eat up? So could you just give us an idea of, of what, <coughs> what would it take you, what would it entail if they were to go in there with their... What's it going to cost us? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I don't envision it being a very long trip. She indicated in one of her correspondence that uh, they'd be paying their crew overtime. So they're looking to get up here and, and move along pretty quickly. It would be... Probably Guy Taylor and myself that would be up there and whoever else they wanted to interview um, in relation to the show. So um, Guy's kind of our resident tour guide of the facility. <laughs> I would get lost if I were in there by myself. So I, I do unfortunately have to, to pull somebody with me, but uh, that, that I would expect no more than enough. And likely it would be outside of the working day anyway. So you're getting free time out of Guy and I. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor, I, I see, you know, both danger and opportunity, uh, <laughs> and it's, most of us probably do. Uh, but um, one thing I see is the opportunity to correct what I saw in the Alexandria um, station and from a Fargo report that we are demolishing. Uh, basically, the word is used overall that we're demolishing the building. And what we need to do, I, I, there's public misconception that we are taking things down totally. Yeah, like it's just general, it's used in a generic way, demolishing the RTC. And that has been, I think, because of the history of constantly fighting against demolition, that's become out. Now, if this story can, if they get the facts from what we're doing with SHPO and they know ahead of time and they film, it could set it, the record straight, you know, um, which is what I would hope if we can do enough clear PR to them and with it. That's my, and I think it's, it's kind of a, like you're going to lose if if we just turn them down. I think there's a, the sense of okay, what are you hiding? And then the misconception remains because those reports were not corrected. And I know Andrew, you, you talked to them about that. They did, and they did not bother to issue a correction or anything. Like that. Right. And I think you're right in the sense, Rod. Even just the email correspondence between this Mary um, back and forth is, yeah, they 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 just they want to get in there real quick before everything's gone, and that's not the case. So I mean, I think there is. I think you're right. There's an opportunity to set the stage if that council has appetite allow them in there for a set period of time um, I think there is an opportunity to set the you know, stage so, yeah. I think I think it would be important to show them kind of like you know the schematics that we've got this is you know basically the phases that we've done and the buildings that we've taken the, the buildings that we have taken down and and then try to get over the reasons why we've removed the tunnels to to help with you know abate coming the water damage and then 
say this is phase two, which is these buildings, which if you look at those buildings, they're relatively modern buildings relative to, you know, the arch, you know, the arc at the front. So I, I, would, I would agree, I think, I, I would say we, we go ahead and do it. Everyone okay with that? Just leave it in Andrew's hands to make it work and just, I think the point is clear though. We do want to make sure that we drive the uh, narrative and tell our story and take the opportunity to set the record straight because I don't think they'll be coming with an agenda. I just want to tell a story and just, we get our opportunity. So, okay, great. Um, now, Elizabeth will call on. Elizabeth Werfel. Werfel from the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities to give uh, an, up, an update. I know you're out touring different Oh yeah, he's got one more item. Sorry. Sorry. Right. <laughs> I didn't know Brian. I didn't know you were leaving too. All right, no. Brian. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this one, pa apologize for latency on this one, but uh, uh, the fee title owner did give me a petition, and we're eager to redevelop uh, the potential for this area. Uh, the, this uh, memo is in regards to a vacation petition received for Platt at Amy Court blocks 11 and 12 of the Aspen Platte to the city of Fergus Falls. It can, if you can refer onto the map, um, uh, this petition was sent out and received just recently. Uh, this Platte is part of the original Aspen Platte recorded in 1995. The new owner of blocks 11 and 12, who is a sole petitioner uh, that owns, and you can refer to the petition on there, uh, lots 1 through 6, Block 11, and Lots 1 through 4 of Block 12 of Aspen. As requested, the vacation of Amy Court as dedicated. Please refer to the map, uh, the yellow highlights on there, which is consistent with what's on the petition, and they're requesting that dedicated right away to be vacated uh, in its entirety and reestablished through the replatting process that's currently underway too in the Planning Commission. Uh, so we have two areas going here is the vacation number one and then an actual replatting that's going to the platting commission. Per our ordinance, uh, any vacations is, is done per, by ordinance. Uh, well, the next step would be to schedule a public hearing uh, for the vacation request, and that's what we're requesting July 16th, City Council. And at that time, too, we'll be sending notices to all the adjacent owners and private utility companies. And I'm going to walk up per the vacation exhibit, which is shown on the map right here. <coughs> As mentioned, Otter Tail Drive, Tower Road, runs north south about here. This area has not been redeveloped ever since. Uh, they're looking to replat. You can kind of see an overlay that's going to the Planning Commission. But yes, this yellow area is the dedicated right away. Now, this is the vacation exhibit that was presented. Uh, the title owner is in agreement, and our city attorney has also reviewed all these matters. Uh, but this line right here, these right of ways are both 50 feet dedicated. This is 50 feet, and this is 30. Uh, but this line de indicates the demarcation of, if approved, uh, this portion of these lands will be reverted back to the abut abutting property owners and this 25 feet will maintain. Uh, the, little, the anomaly is right up in this area right here, uh, the, the owner to the north has consented on verbal, uh, but they indicated uh, that they would, uh, they would accept, they would accept the vacation exhibit as presented. However, that's just a verbal, we would have to go through. Um, uh, like I said, we'll send them a notice if they so choose to want to inform me. Either we'll have an official letter of consent to that, or or we'll be let to be here at the public hearing. So at this time, I'm requesting uh, City Council to accept the Amy Court petition as presented and to set the public hearing date for July 16th, 2018, at the City Council. Uh, the the fees and everything, the application fees of $500 has been received. And the processes for that is usually funded through the application fee. Your Honor, question? Yes, right. Uh, you mentioned Planning Commission. I, does, has this gone through the Planning Commission? I can speak to that. I didn't understand that. The replat. Yeah. The replat. Yep. Yeah. So the, the vacation is a separate process that Brian is um, 
talking about here, the plat um, itself, the replat of the parcels into uh, the five single family lots that you see depicted there will be at the Planning Commission on July 9th. Um, as well, there is a uh, setback variance request that will be at the Board of Zoning. So this is an example of one of those projects that both needs a uh, Planning Commission and a Board of Zoning consideration. So just a, a good example of why we're combining those two groups, moving towards combining those two groups. But this will be reviewed. It was sent out um, to the Planning Commission yesterday um, in advance of the holiday, so it'd be adequate time for them to review and ask questions on uh, this particular plat application. It kind of answers my qu what she just said. I was just wondering what was the indication of what he was going to do. I was wondering if that underlying picture there is what they're actually looking at doing versus what it was originally platted for. That that is important. This is enhancement of the preliminary plat. This is the vacation exhibit that I requested. To, so um, it's still survey. staying. It's still staying the way it is. They're just changing it a little bit. Well, the housing density has changed, the zoning is not. I believe it's still R4 and everything, but they're looking to reorient it and make it a little bit more spatial area than what's uh, been platted thus far. Uh, five lots approximately, and going from, well, as shown, if you please refer to the exhibit, you can see the original plat and the density is, you know, generally about 65 by 85 foot lots. They used to be a little bit significant, a little, little bit larger. And that. But yes, we got two simultaneous actions going. The reason I'm requesting this now because uh, as you go through our ordinance, how we have to do the first reading, develop of the ordinance, the first reading, the second reading, <coughs> and the effect of publication become, before it comes ordinance does take some time. Um, the owner, like I said, is very uh, eagerly to proceed with this if it's <coughs> approved. So there are two simultaneous actions. The preliminary plat is contingent on the vacation. But you said obviously it was going to the Planning Commission on the 9th, but when is it going to the Board of Zoning then? Yes. On the 9th as well. And on the 9th as well. Yep. Right, thanks. So all of those will be done before the 16th. Yeah. Yes. We're trying to crash the schedule a little <coughs> bit on it, you know. I'll offer that, Your Honor, so we can get out of here by 7.30. Motion to bring this to the All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Thank you. I will say all right. Are they letting you drive? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. I'll see if we're letting you drive. Is there a clicker? Not, not a putting hat. You can use the keyboard. Oh, okay. Like this? Oh, it might not be true. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah, I gotta go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There we got it. Go. Okay. I'm gonna have these off. Hi there. Um, as the mayor said, my name is Elizabeth Wafel, and I think I've met most of you before, but I am with the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, and I want to thank you for allowing me to uh, come and meet with you this morning. Um, we are out doing our summer tour. I was in Morris last night. I'm going to be in Perm tonight, and uh, we uh, really enjoy coming out and seeing, but I have to, seeing all of you, but Fergus obviously is one of my favorites, so thank you for letting me be here. Um, I think most of you know this, but the CGMC is an organization that Fergus has been a long and active member of. We are um, actually a growing organization. We are we hit 97 cities this year. We're aiming for at least 100. Um, we're we're united in uh, you know all over the state, but united in issues that are kind of common across all of us, including local government aid and property tax issues, economic development, annexation, land use. Um, transportation and environmental regulation. I uh, personally handle a lot of the environmental lobbying as well as the annexation and land use issues. Um, this was kind of, you know, every year I, I, I say that this was the strangest session yet, and I, I'll, I'll say that again. You know, we keep thinking there's some kind of normal, but there's not. Um, you know, we went into this, it was a short session, the second half of the biennium, the even years always is. Um, it was supposed to be focused on a mainly policy and a bonding bill. Um, however, because of significant changes at the federal level, we were also re expecting um, a tax bill to respond to those changes. Um, and with a budget surplus, legislators always feel a little tempted to uh, pass a, a supplemental budget bill. Um, the final thing that we were looking forward to was a pension bill, because that's something that the legislature had delayed dealing with for three years. 
However, um, there was a lot of black, bad blood going into the legislative session, and I think this affected the final outcome. Um, the legislature hadn't been happy with Governor Dayton's veto of their funding. We had a razor thin majority in the Senate. You know, one vote basically made the difference on everything they were, I should say, on all the significant things they were voting on. Um, and to make things even more difficult, we had the ongoing controversy involving who our lieutenant governor was. Um, that coupled with the fact that it was an election year made for some very interesting political decisions. Sorry, I did something here. Okay, I'm gonna pull this up here so at least. <laughs> okay, um, basically the things we were focusing on, uh, bonding bill was very big, as well as positioning ourselves for the 2019 election. Um, really pushing on more water and wastewater uh, money, trying to educate in, uh, the legislators on the high costs of compliance with wastewater regulations, continuing our LGA advocacy, pushing for corridors of commerce funding, which is uh, uh, funding of major highway projects, um, continue city street funding. We are really trying to get more state money for city streets, as well as highlighting the child care uh, shortage issue and starting to advance solutions on this particular item. Um, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, the wastewater and water infrastructure continues to be a very big issue for us because, you know, even if you're not facing uh, something new this year, over the next few years, most of our cities will have, be having to either upgrade their facilities, rehab pipes, whatnot. So it's really important to us that we really get the state focused on this and get more money into this program. Um, our proposal for this year, a bill introduced by uh, Representative Erdahl and Senator Dames, would have put $167 million into these programs. Um, and uh, that was matched, and Governor put out a similar uh, request as well. The other thing we did on these issues is that one of the things we are discovering is that, particularly with some of our smaller cities, but it affects um, quite a number of them, the existing PFA programs do not provide enough money to keep their um, sewer rates at a reasonable level even when they're getting 80 percent match of some of their projects. So we also introduced a supplemental grant program. Um, did a lot on this. We had press conferences, guest columns uh, throughout the state, multiple legislative hearings on this. We really have become to many legislators sort of the go-to organization on wastewater funding. Um, so we've, we're becoming a sort of a statewide voice on this issue and the need for more money. Um, ultimately, there was $123 million included in the bonding bill on this. Um, we would have liked to have seen more, and we probably would have liked to have seen maybe a fewer, fewer uh, earmarks, but we were glad that that level is high. We want to see that level go up even more in future years, because otherwise it's going to create a backlog. Um, we would have liked to have seen the supplemental grant program. We got that to advance pretty far, but ultimately, um, the uh, PFA pushed back on it too hard. So we're going to be looking for alternatives to that in the future because we do think um, that more needs to be done. But overall, you know, pretty good success on this. Um, other developments with respect to that, um, there was also some policy changes we were able to make in the bonding bill that I think longer term are going to help our, our, our uh, members. Um, they may sound technical, but I think they'll make a big difference during uh, wastewater uh, uh, permit negotiations. And the two big things there are is that the MBCA needs to start considering debt load when it's looking at the compliance schedules. So basically, you know, when they're determining how they're going to be implementing permits, they can't just look at, you know, what does the water need to look at, but also how can we do this in a way that, you know, cities aren't going to go bankrupt. Um, there's also what we're calling the Permit Holder Bill of Rights, sort of recognizing that cities need to be able to di discuss and negotiate um, their permits, but uh, some of them don't realize they actually have the ability to do that. So the MPCA is now going to be affirmatively required to be telling cities sort of of their rights going into these processes. Um, we were also happy, I worked uh, quite a bit on making sure that we had what we call the regulatory certainty signed into law, and what that means is if you upgrade your facility, you can't be required to um, have new requirements requiring more money for at least 16 years to give you a chance to pay down your debt. Um, there's actually quite a bit more we did, but it's all in the report. I could talk about wastewater for the entire hour, but I think <laughs> that would probably put you to sleep. Um, 
Transportation, also a big issue. House and Senate uh, taking very different approaches. Senate didn't want to put any funding into roads. Houses wanted to fund it out of the surplus. We supported that second approach. Um, we also supported ongoing funding for city streets as well as putting some money into quarters of commerce. Um, big topic, though, was the uh, constitutional amendment. As you may be aware, there was a push to have a constitutional amendment dedicating certain uh, sales taxes specifically to roads, and you know there would have been some funding for city streets. We were one of a number of organizations that came out hard against this and pushed back. Ultimately, it failed. Um, in case you're wondering why we pushed so hard against this, because some people are like, well, don't we want money going to streets? We do want money going to streets. We think we need to find a better funding source. The problem is, is when you do it in this manner, it basically ties your hands. And the more you tie the legislature's hands when you have budget crises, which we'll have again, they happen, then it, it leaves very little room for where they take money away, and then they take money away from things like local government aid. We've seen this happen in the past. We know it will happen in the future if we tie their hands too much. Um, corridors of commerce. Uh, this uh, Last year, there was a lot of money put into this. The problem was is that the factors they set, the, the legislature set up MnDOT with basically resulted this year in all of that money being spent on very metrocentric projects. Um, and this is something we pushed back on hard and sort of the compromise solution was putting more money in 2018 into this program so that Greater Minnesota was seeing more of the money. So over the two year span, the money is balanced out between, or better balanced between the metro area and Greater Minnesota. Um, tax policy. Federal, as I mentioned, federal conformity with the new s federal tax law was a big issue for the legislature and it sucked a little bit of the air out of the room in terms of getting other things done. We had a big priority um, of trying to increase local government aid. We are still continuing to try and push that up to and beyond the 2002 level, which is when we'd seen that big significant decrease. Um, and we are also working on updating the need factors in LGA. Um, the reason we're doing that is that we are seeing some of our cities basically plateau out on what they're getting in LGA because of the way the factors work. And we, one of the things we've realized is that the formula was written in, in 20, rewritten in 2013. The formula itself is still good, but some of the factors need to be updated periodically. So we introduced a bill that would do that as well. Um, you can kind of see what, where we, we're talking about this flattening. The goal that we're, we're trying to do basically is increase you over time um, rather than having that flatness. So the, again, the bill would have done two things, put more money in there and increase that. Um, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't included in the final tax bill, but the final tax bill was not signed by the governor. This is an issue we will be bringing forward next year because, again, Local government aid is very important to our cities like Fergus, and we want to, it to be, continue to be a dynamic program. Child care is something we've been hearing about more and more from our members as a significant issue throughout the state. I have to say, it's, it almost took us by surprise last year how big an issue this is and very many pockets of it. And what we're finding is, is that you know, child care is an issue in the metro as well, but it's more significant in Greater Minnesota and for different reasons. So we've been working with our sister organization, Greater Minnesota Partnership, to try and bring more attention to this uh, issue. Um, worked on some programs including grant funding, um, training more child uh, care providers. Um, there was funding for our grant program in the supplemental budget bill. Um, this is something I haven't talked that much about, but uh, the basically the legislature decided it was their strategic move to roll all of their budget bills this year into one big omnibus omnibus bill. The problem with doing that is it is that it uh, you're sort of tempting fate. Is um, that when you put everything into one bill, you can have some good stuff, bad stuff. You might end up with the entire thing vetoed, and that's what happened. So again, an issue we will continue to push on. Um, BDPI money, again, a program that the Greater Minnesota CGMC helped establish a number of years ago. Uh, I think almost all of our cities have used it. We got money put into it in the bonding bill last year, but a lot of that money is already gone, so we sought to put more money into it this year, which we did. Um, it's a great program for helping business development infrastructure in Greater Minnesota. Um, we just want to keep putting more money in there because our cities use it to, and it, it just sort of compounds itself exponentially, really helps economic development. 
Um, this is going to be a big year, I think, uh, unless you've been under a rock. You probably know we have a gubernatorial election, and that will have a significant impact on both sides. Um, we could see majority flip in the House. There is a much smaller chance that the Senate um, majority could flip. I, I don't think it's likely, but it is possible because they have that razor thin majority and they have a special election in the fall. Um, it's going to be a budget year next year, and we really don't know from an economic standpoint whether we're going to be having a surplus or a deficit, you know, and that does impact our plans and in many ways. Obviously, we're hoping for a surplus um, would allow us to move forward on our plans for local government aid. If, it, if it's the other direction, then we will be out there full force defending the program. Uh, we are going to be very active this election season. It's probably no surprise to you if you've been involved with us before. Right now we are working on a candidate packet that we will be sending out hopefully by next week, educating legislators in both rural Minnesota and greater Minnesota on the issues that matter to us. Big portion on local government aid. We spend time talking about wastewater, but those things that matter to all of us. Um, I hope that some of you can make it down to our conference in Mankato. We are going to be doing a gubernatorial forum. We've had um, on the Democratic side, uh, Aaron Murphy and Tim Waltz have both um, uh, confirmed that they are going to attend. We are waiting to hear from Lori Swanson, but we're hoping she will attend. We have been confirmed by uh, um, Jeff Johnson as well and are waiting to hear from Palenti. So we, are, we should have a pretty good lineup there. Um, we are going to be doing candidate forums throughout the state, particularly in open seats. Um, and we're going to be monitoring what uh, candidates say on key issues like local government aid. Um, opportunities for next year, again, we are planning to push for more LGA. We think we need to continue. It, it should be a dynamic program. We want to continue doing that, we'll continue to work on the child care crisis. I know that we will continue to make water and wastewater a priority um, because it is such a huge budget item for our cities and looking more for permanent funding for city streets. Uh, upcoming dates, again, the summer conference, it's that combined Mankato, North Mankato, St. Peter. We had a lovely time here last year in Fergus Falls with our city uh, summer conference, and we hope that some of you can kind of return the favor and come down to Mankato uh, in St. Peter. Um, fall conference will be just up the road, I guess down the road from here um, in Alexandria in November. And Legislative Action Day, which is our most popular event of the year, is on is scheduled for January 30th. So we hope we can join you for some, or hope you can join us. Um, but thank you again. Fergus has been, you know, one of our longest time members, one of our strongest members, and we really appreciate your continuing advocacy because it really helps make us effective. Thank you, Elizabeth. We really appreciate everything the coalition does. Does anyone on the council have any questions for Elizabeth? I got one short question, I think, or short answer. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, the difference in child care from Minneapolis, St. Paul to greater Minnesota, what you were saying there is an actual difference there. Could that. you? Do you want to? Yeah, why don't you? <laughs> if you're more an that. expert than I am, why don't you talk about it? <clears throat> I'm just curious as to yeah. the <laughs> Mayor, Councilmember Appert, um, I serve on the GMP uh, uh, Board of Directors, and the child care topic is something I've been very much pushing for the last two years. Mm -hmm. I brought it up last year, and and then this year we were very hopeful that we we're going to get some traction. But the difference is, is in um, the big difference is in just Greater Minnesota. There just isn't available spots for licensed quality child care. So. You know, even if you're not selective about who you may want to take your infant, especially infant care, in, in Fergus Falls, we often hear of one to one and a half year waits to get into an infant spot. In the Twin Cities, you can get a spot. I mean, it's, you might have to drive an extra five miles or not be on your road, but there's spots available. But in greater Minnesota, there just aren't licensed spots. So that's a big piece of it. Um, <coughs> cost. Um, you know the the wage scale so it you know and then there's factors of why that is and that comes into all sorts of things the wage scales of the child care workers um, in greater Minnesota it's, it's quite low and so and with the availability of other employment opportunities and the um, you know still in our three percent unemployment there's other opportunities and it's hard work so it is hard to recruit people to work in that field so that's a high level um, I have a lot of information. I'd be happy to sit down and talk about the efforts we've been doing here locally at any point. No, I have to answer that. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Amy. Again, thank you. You're Elizabeth. welcome. Happy, safe travels as you trek across the state and visit our 
And, and thank you. And, and one, more, one more final thank you I do want to make to you, if I may, may do so. Um, uh, as you may or may not know, Fergus Falls is also a member of the Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails Organization, um, which is also represented by our firm. It's a completely separate organization from the CGMC, but I do want to thank you on behalf of that organization for your membership. Um, that's uh, been a growing group and is doing a significant uh, work on uh, improving recreational opportunities in Greater Minnesota. So thank you for your participation in that as well. All right, so next item on the agenda is a uh, session on D Lagoon soccer upgrades and city partnership. Amen. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, last Monday, uh, Kevin Fulbum, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, Felbaum. Felbaum, sorry. He uh, approached the park board about uh, upgrades to the soccer facility out at D Lagoon. The uh, park board is in favor of upgrades that are needed out there. And uh, Kevin's just going to come and present to you on what they feel the needs are and then uh, request some guidance on the process. And one thing I was thinking is if a uh, council representative could maybe be appointed to the soccer association as a liaison, similar to the uh, golf board and the hockey association, just to shepherd them through this process. Thanks, Guy. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor, Council. Uh, as, as was stated, I'm Kevin Felbaum. I'm actually the Otter Tail County Drainage Engineer. I'll take that hat off today. I'm actually <laughs> representing the Far Fergus Falls Youth Soccer Association. I'm actually a U10 uh, coach and also the field coordinator. Uh, the reason we came before the city is we actually saw a, a piece on Facebook where you were looking for kind of your long-term planning. We saw that. We said, you know, hey, we're growing. We want to be on that long-term planning to, uh, to work with the city. So just a little background on soccer. Um, it's actually the most watched and participated sport in the entire world. Um, estimated 3.5 billion people watch or play soccer. It's uh, one of the fastest growing sports in the United States. Um, I'm assuming hopefully some of you have seen on TV lately with the World Cup. I mean, it, it's a kind of a big deal um, as far as soccer um, growing and, and more and more people being involved with it. Um, it's a sport that is popular for both boys and girls. Um, Fergus Falls Youth Soccer, we actually hold a season in the spring and in the fall. Um, a benefit to soccer is not much equipment is needed. It's, it's, it's relatively cheap uh, for even for low-income families to be a part of this association to play. Um, I mean, all you need is the ball, shin guards, cleats. Uh, also easy to practice. I mean, you don't need a lot of area to, to hone your skills and become a better soccer player. Uh, the other benefit is, is lots of people can play at the same time. So, you know, in a, in a big game, it's 11 versus 11. Uh, the Fergus Falls Youth Soccer Association is a nonprofit organization that is, organ is the organizational body of youth soccer in Fergus Falls. Uh, our organization handles pre-K to sixth grade. Currently, there is no middle school program in Fergus Falls. We're, we're, we're looking at hopefully getting to that point. And then obviously, there is the junior varsity and varsity team at the school. Um, we actually pull athletes from surrounding school districts to take part in our organization. Uh, we've had children from Underwood, Battle Lake, Henning, and Pelican Rapids come and play soccer uh, for Fergus. Um, the organization is currently made up of seven volunteer parents, one of them being the current uh, head soccer coach. Um, the fields are at De Lagoon Park. Um, our seasons, uh, we have a spring rec from April to July, that's pre-K to sixth grade. Um, our spring summer competitive, that's our traveling teams, that is a range from first grade up to 12th grade. Um, and depending on, you know, what type of athletes we get to come out, you know, we may have two U10, a U12, U14, U19 teams. That's all depending on how many athletes we get to come out. Um, we do have a fall recreational league from August to October. Again, that's pre-K to sixth grade. Um, actually, last year what we did is we started a fall competitive um, where we've reached out to other communities, Alexandria, Morris, where we're going to do those kids that played in the spring summer competitive, we want to make sure that they stay competitive because they're at a different level than the rec kids. So, uh, you know, we're reaching out to those other communities to set up some games for the fall. Um, our traveling teams play against and host matches at De Lagoon Park against the following communities, uh, Grand Forks, Fargo, Detroit Lakes, Alexandria, Little Falls, Thief River Falls, Crookston, Walker, Minnewaska, and Morris. 
Um, our program, um, as stated before, I mean, soccer being one of the most popular sports in the world, um, you know, we're seeing that kind of that trend come towards Fergus, where you know we're getting numbers that continue to grow. Um, shown here is the last four years, um, 2018 here. I mean, we had over 200 plus kids in spring rec, and we've got 100 plus kids in traveling. So I mean, there's a lot, a lot of kids out there on Tuesday, Thursday nights practicing and uh, you know, playing soccer. Um, that picture there is sh actually showing the success that we're starting to have uh, in 2017, our U12 team. Uh, there's an annual Rotary Cup tournament in Detroit Lakes. They went and actually won that tournament. So that was a, a pretty big success for the program. Um, so why I'm here today is, is long-term planning. With, with that many kids and parents out at De Lagoon, uh, the, the facility is getting a bit cramped. So, uh, you know, why I'm here is, is the Youth Soccer Association would like to work with the City of Fergus Falls to make sure that we continue to grow and improve the organization. Uh, we want to make sure that the athletes and their parents and other towns' athletes and parents see what a great community Fergus Falls is. Uh, De Lagoon Park is actually a very beautiful asset to the city. It, it's a great park. Uh, we would like to work with the city to improve upon the current soccer facility uh, in order to better serve the expanding amount of children and parents that are, are using the soccer facility. The current layout, if, if you recall, here is, uh, so the soccer storage building is right in the parking lot there, circled in blue. Um, the layout of our fields currently, we have two U19s and a rec, uh, they're uh, bordered in red. We have it set up for three U12 fields, shown in orange, and then way up on the hill we have two U10 fields. All obviously at varying sizes uh, based on the age of the children playing. There we go. Perfect. Skip, it skipped, skipped one. one? Okay. Go. So the improvements that we're looking for, uh, the, the big item would be a, a bathroom facility concession stand and then also additional field space. Um, before the FS or Fergus Falls Youth Soccer would like to do any fundraising, um, you know, we wanted to be a partner with the city because at the end of the day, this is a city park. It's not our facility. Um, but, you know, with us controlling the soccer, um, we want to make sure that you know we're working with the city as far as you know we see a need for expanded facilities as far as bathrooms and more fields. But at the end of the day, it, it is the city's park, so we would like to work with the city on you know improving this facility. So uh, some of those items that we would like to improve are you know, new field locations. Uh, I mean, this was just what we came up with as the board. I mean, this is not set in stone. This is just ideas from our board as far as where we would like to see uh, additional fields or, you know, could we, could we actually do a field here? Um, the bigger of the two would actually be an additional U10. That way we'd have three U10 fields. Um, and then that area shown in orange would be uh, U12. Um, or even just a rec field for some of the pre-K kids uh, that do, do not need a large field. Excuse me. Um, improved bathroom concession facility. Um, why did we need that? Um, currently, uh, the city provides us with one um, porta potty. It's uh, down near the road. Um, the soccer association ourselves actually this year went and got four of our own porta potties and had them brought in. The concern there being, is, you know, the waste trucks are driving out on the fields and, you know, could crush sprinklers and that sort of thing. We had them out on the field just because of convenience. If you've been out to De Lagoon Park, you've, you've seen that large hill where we've got, you know, children, grandparents up playing soccer. They come up and go, well, where's the bathroom? Well, we have to point them down to either the road or if you're familiar with the area down where that, uh, the playground system is, that's where the closest bathrooms are. Our, our concern as the association is, is one, safety. I mean, we've got kids from pre-K to sixth grade. I mean, as, the, as one of the coaches, um, I mean, I've got, you know, 20-some kids on the team running around, all of a sudden one of them says, hey, i got to go to the bathroom. Okay, well, I'll, I'll let them go. But what they've got to do now is, is, is cross the parking lot, cross the street to get to that bathroom facility. Ten minutes go by, by the time they come back, well, I'm still 
hosting practice, you know, it's, it's tough to check back in. It's like, oh, hey, did Tommy come back? Um, in some instances, there's a, there are parents that come and drop their child off and, and take off and go do other things. Well, so now I'm responsible for that child. That's it. In my eyes, it's a, it's a huge safety concern, you know, sending some of these five, six-year-old kids down to go use the restroom. Um, convenience, another thing, as I said, you know, we have grandparents, parents, you know, small siblings of the, of the athletes up watching their siblings play. That's a long way to send some people. Sometimes they just, they just can't make it that far. And then, as I said, the need. I mean, you know, if you'd be out on a Tuesday, Thursday night when we're hosting practice, you know, we're talking 300 plus athletes alone and not including the parents, grandparents, and siblings. You know, three, four porta potties is, at this point is not really cutting it. So that's uh, just some item we wanted to bring. Um, and as the Youth Soccer Association, we'd like to say thank you, and we look forward to working with the city on our, our plan and proposal and, and hopefully get some direction because, you know, it's all volunteer as far as the <coughs> Youth Soccer Association. So. Thank you, Kevin. Do you have any uh, time frame as far as what you guys are looking at in developing a plan? Fundraising? I mean, you know, the sooner the better would be awesome, but I mean, we understand that, you know, it takes time. So that's why when we saw that posting on Facebook or in the paper about the city's long term planning, we said, you know, hey, we want to get on board with that so that, you know, we can be a part of that because I mean, there's a, a need out at the soccer association for bathrooms, concession, and field. So. Um, does anyone on the council have a, in time, are you a soccer parent? I'm not, <clears throat> but um, uh, Kevin and I have, have he reached out to me um, initially, and uh, I, I, we, I would say we uh, appoint the most knowledgeable, uh, <laughs> <laughs> most Rock. knowledgeable football yeah. um, uh, player, but I would, I would be happy to uh, also work with the uh, soccer association. So. Yeah, I think team up with some, you got Rotary and you got other, and I'm not specifically saying that, but you got other service organizations that, you know, could maybe take this on as a project or mm -hmm. you work in conjunction with them along with your own fundraising efforts. And yeah. I think some money should come pretty fast. I know it's probably very preliminary, um, but are you guys, what's your ballpark figure of what some of the renovations you would, look to do, would you stage it or would you, I mean, because two fields and a concession, I mean, I know it's early stage, do you have any idea on um, We what, don't, what I mean, run? and we don't even have, I mean, we've got a plan to go out and do fundraising, but we didn't even want to tackle that until we talked with the city, because right. obviously at the end of the day, it's, it's the city's facility. Um, you know, big ticket item would definitely be the bathrooms. I mean, if, if we never even got the field upgrades, that's fine by us. The big thing was is, you know, we need more bathrooms just because the amount of people we have out there and, and obviously for the safety of, of the children, so. How far is infrastructure away you know, to set up the to water? To We've got sewer. water and sewer at Shoreview, the cul-de-sac that's just to the south of the complex. I so it could to be extended into the field area. That'd be the, that'd be the quick, that'd be the easiest path from that. Yeah. At the end of that call to sack you said there is? Yep. Could we ask uh, Councilmember Roofer and Councilmember Speedall to meet along with Department Next Director, meet with the soccer board and see if they can um, just get conversations started? Here, I think uh, we should have the Park and Rec board kind of head this also. I mean, they're the ones that's going to be talking about it. And I talked to Plaza about, ye about it yesterday, and uh, he thinks that that's to be the best way to go through it, get something from the council, and then you guys get it going and bring it back to us as we a recommendation. So. Uh -huh. There, fine Perfect. with everybody. Yeah. Yep. Is that a good place to start? Awesome. Okay. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Thanks Kevin. Kevin. Last item on the agenda is a parking recommendation update from our Chief of Public Safety, Kyle Berger. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> and actually, uh, it was Council Member Speedall uh, that had uh, requested that this item come back to you. So. Um, I think uh, after our first uh, discussion about the issues with parking, uh, we kind of brought to light that it's more of a parking management issue. Um, you know, Rod had talked to me a little bit about wanting to get uh, this in information back in front of the council as far as recommendations. 
And uh, as you can see by my uh, memo, uh, my recommendations at this point are, are fairly limited. And, and I think the biggest reason for that is uh, so much of what potentially could happen is dependent on your projects. And I think that uh, it would be prudent that, um, that any type of uh, major uh, parking management change uh, is in correspondence with doing those projects. Uh, I've had a chance to talk with uh, Brian uh, a little bit about that. And uh, I think that uh, he strongly agrees with that uh, philosophy. Um, but again, I just brought it back to you as discussion. There's obviously some things that uh, we could look at implementing uh, now. Uh, but I think for me, the biggest thing is when, if, if we do roll out a big change, uh, I really think that it should be well planned out. There's gotta be a informational or educational piece to that and so for me, I kind of go back to uh, what's the best timing uh, to do this. So with that, I will just kind of open it up to you guys for any questions or thoughts that you might have um, with it. Questions? Uh, thank you. I, I had a couple of thoughts. Um, I kind of think that you know, from a timing point of view, if we're going to do anything, we should kind of like, as you say, do an educational piece and then kind of look to say enforcement being January 1 as opposed to trying to, you know, so it's clean. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think that you're know, going back to obviously that the restricted parking on Lincoln is, and, and enforcing that is good, and then most of the things. And then I also wondered about whether we could offer two, two kind of reserved like parking stalls you know and and maybe you know have one that's like a daytime a daytime reservation piece and then one that's a 24-hour one and obviously the daytime one would be monday through friday you know and and, and be eight o'clock till mm -hmm. five o'clock and then and it could be say color color coded blue and then one that's a 24-hour one you know could have a different color sure red or something and then obviously the you know, fee structure would be based accordingly. And then in an evening when a lot of those office ones, you know, aren't used in an evening, you know, that would actually free up parking spots for the general public to use. Um, and I did, um, I did mention that uh, within the memo, uh, or the one that's labeled, sorry about that, parking management strategies. I think maybe, um, to, to build off of what Anthony said is um, maybe I'll work with Public Works to send out um, uh, a letter to those who currently rent just to see, just to get some kind of a basis, how many people are interested in going to a, uh, uh, like a parking permitted system where you're not necessarily given a specific spot but you, your permit allows you, like Anthony said, to park in a permitted stall uh, for that, you know, period of time. Because I think that that is something that, you know, I, I would note is when you have just strictly a rented stall, no one else gets to use that stall. And most, I would say most of our rented stalls are businesses who uh, want a place for their employees to park in a parking lot. So they're used just a very small percentage of, of the day. Um, and we do have some uh, uh, tenants that have rented stalls, but um, you know, I, I think maybe to uh, just go out and get some more information about how many more, or how many people would be interested in that. You know, the only other thing I said is, you know, our parking uh, fee structure for a rented stall is pretty low. I think Guy had indicated about $18 a month. Well, even at $30 a month, that's a dollar a day that's guaranteeing you a parking spot that no one else can use. I mean, that's, it's, I would say, a, bar, and a bargain taken, at $30 a month. The bigger aspect is it's taken away from somebody else. Yes. I mean, yeah. you're, lock, you're blocking it off, and that's kind of where you yep. say if there was two, two kind of sure. two fee structures, then 
you know, that would hopefully maybe people would opt for the kind of the business day one and, and not the 24 hour one. Sure. I don't know if anybody, so I can certainly, we'll keep moving Working forward with that. I think that was one of the questions uh, that I had is, is that something that um, you're interested in is exploring more of a, a permitted parking area versus a rented stall parking area. And then uh, as indicated, I think it, it makes sense to uh, work in, in conjunction with some of the projects. And I know the city has got a, a city planner that's coming on board. I think, uh, you know, this is something that's more in the city planner's wheelhouse. So we'll work on that transition process as well. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll just reach out to those uh, <coughs> rent and stall owners and see how what their interest is in a, in a different type of system. So, thank you, Kyle. Yep. Perfect. Anything else to come before the committee? I think a couple of other things maybe that we can get updates on would be following up on the car park discussion would be an update on the West Car Park and where we're at with the with the proposals for that, and, and also. We, can we talk about H2M and counter propaganda? We, you know, we, we've they've created a video, but part of the remit for H2M was also to help with some counter propaganda for all the closings. And, and I think something we that's something we need to talk about. Sure. I, in, in address the first one, I believe at the next committee meeting we'll be bringing a recommendation from four four proposals that were submitted. So. Uh, Moving forward on that one with the with the West Car Park, and then uh, we can ask uh, Andrew. Make sure Andrew's aware that uh, update on H two M at the next committee meeting. Just uh, clear the West lot is about the sorry. removal of the posts. Yeah, removal of the posts and things. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I behind, was behind about behind behind Sears. Yeah, that that, that lot. I can oh, update sorry. you shortly on that quickly. Um, we're just finishing up street patches from winter water main and sewer main repairs. So as soon as that's all done, um, and we're going to take care of a lot of trip hazards down on the pavers, down on the uh, Lincoln Avenue. And when those two projects are done, then we're going to start on the parking lot removing okay. the posts. So hopefully it'll be within the next two or three weeks. Okay, Mike, thank you. Uh, that will be adjourned. Sorry, I was talking.